ट्रेजरर सुहास परांजपे सीनियर्स एंड फ्रेंड्स अ वेरी वॉर्म गुड इवनिंग टू ऑल ऑफ यू गुड इवनिंग इट्स माई प्लेजर टू हैव वेलकम ऑल ऑफ यू टू दिस सेशन ऑन जी एस टी प्रोपोज रिटर्न फॉर्मेट जी एस टी ऑफकोर्स वी बीन टॉकिंग अबाउट इट एज वन ऑफ द मोस्ट इम्पॉर्टेंट लैंडमार्क रिफॉर्म्स ऑफ द सेंचुरी वाइल द लॉ ट्राई टू सिंप्लीफाई टू मेनी थिंग्स एट द सेम टाइम वेन इट केम टू द ट्रांजेक्शनल लेवल अपलोड we started facing difficulties in the return flow process of gstr 1 2 3 and all those things and that's all history we are all uh, bone the brunt of uh, that process and uh, that's where uh, the government actually had to do a interim course correction by way of substituting gstr 3b for gstr 2 and 3 the gstr 1 continues that interim process has its own sets of issues which need to be separately resolved but in the meantime uh, based on various trade representations and uh, feedback the government thought it fit that we should have a simplified single return rather than a stage three stage filing process and that's where the gst council adopted this uh, concept of a single return filing uh, for the all the sss of course in certain cases quarterly uh, quarterly periodicity and in some cases a monthly periodicity the draft returns are there in the public domain and when we really look at those draft returns the question which emerges is are these proposed gst return formats really simple enough because the whole objective was to really make it simple we might coin words like sahaj sugam but are they really the english versions of those words of sahaj and sugam there are many questions which are there we did have a very interactive meeting with uh, the gst and ceo wherein he talked about the existing portal related issues uh, just uh, last fortnight and this is that and the new written formats we felt it uh, appropriate that before really the formats uh, get finalized and uh, the systems developments happen and then we start facing the brunt once again perhaps it's time to really start a bit early and understand what exactly is there in the new written formats maybe it's not implemented immediately but it's important to understand because it's a long term process which we are looking at and if we find that there are some gaps or some uh, course corrections required in this proposals uh, the gst and ceo was also very candid in uh, inviting representations and as bcas we would be keen to send some representation so based uh, today's discussions if we really find some points to represent we can definitely take them up at an appropriate uh, time to the respective forum but coming back to this uh, proposed formats uh, essentially if you look at it you will find that to a, to a large extent it's the old uh content which is really coming back in a particular way so when you look at the new uh, format is it really a you know old wine in a new bottle is it just a change of the names of gstr 1 2 3 into annexures to the single return which we are talking about or is it really a game changer in terms of simplicity that's a major question which comes uh, before all of us an ancillary question which comes is how are we going to handle the transition because in the new process what we are going to highlight is to say that you will not be able to add additional invoices by uh, the process so when you are moving from one old gstr 1 2 3 regime to the new regime how is that transition going to be carried out to discuss all of this we thought we'll have a lecture meeting where we can uh, understand all these aspects and uh, when we thought about a uh, name for this lecture meeting the one name which immediately came to our mind was someone from amongst us itself uh, samir kapadia who has been uh, on the managing committee of the bombay chartered accountants society since uh, a fairly long time i think he is one of the senior most in terms of the number of years on the managing committee uh, he has been a convener of the indirect tax committee and he is very active on various activities on indirect taxes he is a certified nakin gst trainer and has contributed at various uh, lectures and uh, seminars and other areas in the past he has been a convener of the committee of the chamber of tax consultants as well and it's my pleasure to welcome you samir today uh, for this session and uh, looking forward to a very interesting session from you before i request you to speak may i request manish to present a small uh, moment as a mark of our love and affection over to you samir
very good evening to all of you. Uh, first of all, I would like to express my gratitude to BCS for giving me this uh, opportunity. Uh, what I intend to do today is uh, share a few thoughts that I have got as far as this uh, new return formats are concerned. Uh, to begin with, uh, the process, uh, the steps that I intend to take or and the manner in which I intend to uh, go ahead with this presentation is that first I will talk about what the current uh, return filing process is. Uh, briefly talk about some of the challenges that uh, we have faced uh, in the current process. Uh, some of the recommendations that BCS had made to GSTN uh, when it came to the current format as well as what was uh, uh, being proposed in terms of changes uh, when Model A and Model B was proposed by Mr. Nilekani. Thereafter, get straight to the new process. In the new process, I will uh, briefly talk about some of the terms which have been given in the notes along with the return. And at the same time, uh, keep the returns also on so that we can uh, actually see where those items are going to be tabulated in the returns. And then just uh, do a comparative between what the expectations were and whether these have been met. If they have not been met, whether we are better off or worse off. When GSTN was, uh, uh, when GST was uh, being ushered in, one of the key things that uh, everybody was talking about is the compliance process. And all the while we were told that it would be very, very simple. You would upload your data in three parts. The first part being your uh, outward supply, which, which would happen by the 10th. Thereafter, between 11th and 15th, you would have to reconcile whatever are your inward supplies. Basically, they said that you will get all the data on an auto-populated basis. You look at the data and either accept, either reject, add, modify, or keep pending. Depending on what you upload by the 15th, a summary return would be prepared with your liability by the 20th and you discharge your liability by the 20th. Now, very clearly you can see the picture on the right. That was what was originally promised to us to say that this is going to be a very, very smooth process. There is going to be very little effort that you will have to do. Maximum effort will go in preparing and uploading the data of outward supply. Everything else is going to be automated. There will be no hiccups at all. But when the actual filing process began, as uh, people who are you know neck deep in the compliance process who have to deal with it every day in and out, you would realize that actually the step one was filing GSTR one. Thereafter, whatever you filled became part of GSTR two A of your customer, which he was expected to accept, reject, add, modify, which would again come back to you in your GSTR one A after which you would be able to tabulate your uh, GSTR3 and thereafter upload it. Now from the first month itself, GSTR1 did not take off. They managed to stabilize it by somewhere mid-September and thereafter there was an attempt made even for uh, GSTR2, but they realized that the system was just not able to cope with it. Now, there were various reasons for that and they had to come up with GSTR3B. Now, the moment you try and look at the process, the picture on the left tells you what is the kind of difficulty that everybody had to face. I mean, when you are tabulating data, something as simple as outward supply data, you had to break it up into several tables. First, you had to say whether it was a B2B or B2C supply. If it were a B2C supply, you would again have to break it whether it is a local or interstate. If it were interstate, you would have to break it up to say, is it below a particular amount or is it above a particular amount? You would have to report it in a separate table. In B2B, you would have to say whether this is a normal supply or is it a SEZ supply. In SEZ, again, you would have to go down to say, is it with payment, without payment? Exports was a different thing. Advances was a different table. Debit note, credit notes were a different table. Now, if you look at your normal sale or purchase register, everybody who was into compliance with VAT or for that matter, service tax was used to a sales register and a purchase register. And all one had to do was to upload summary data. Nobody was required or other most people did not have to 
compile it in so many different different formats and give each and every item in detail you had to give probably one or two lines worth of data and fill up the return the difficulty started when you had to give so much so much amount of information every time each and every field in the return was being validated and errors were being thrown up so during one of the discussions that we had with uh, mr prakash kumar he said that people keep on asking that why does it take so much time to upload the return and why don't we get an acknowledgement immediately the fact of the matter he said is that when you upload the return we actually validate each and every field that you are uploading we check it simultaneously against whatever are the other databases that we have to compare it to for instance whether the gstin is valid or not whether the gstin is a normal gstin or is it an scz gstin whether the place of supply is proper whether the calculation is proper so on so forth he said we perform so many checks before we actually uh, validate the return and tell you that yes this is proper one of the biggest things uh, and the most uh, difficult thing that they are doing is they are actually checking whether each and every invoice that you have raised is a unique invoice or not has it been raised earlier or not now, that is not so simple when you consider a database which has millions and millions of records to check it and come back in 20 minutes is not a small task it's not an easy task so to that extent i would say that they were doing a great job but the fact of the matter is that what do the taxpayers do i mean they are left hanging high and dry they wait to know whether or not the return has been uploaded and they wait endlessly part of the reasons when they prepared the mandate to give to uh, gstn they said okay there will be so many people who will be filing but they did not anticipate the rush of the small taxpayers also now most of these taxpayers and as is the habit with everybody only now things are changing everybody goes to the gstn portal for uploading only on the last date this month i'm sure a lot of people would have tried to take advantage of the holidays in between and try to upload their uh, data and they would have seen that despite having paid and despite having uploaded the data it was not getting reflected immediately on the portal in fact the last two days i believe were quite uh, nerve wracking and people have been waiting and waiting and waiting so both the pictures that you see on the screen are uh, the simple uh, chaos that everybody has to face every month most of the time you see that we are serving already 1000 150000 people please wait now this is not the message that most of the taxpayers expected because when gstn was being assured in at that time most of the ministers most of the uh, people who were responsible they said that you don't have to worry volume is not an issue this is capable of doing x number of transactions simultaneously but as you can see that never happened what was the outcome every month people are waiting for an extension i'm sure you would have seen hundreds and hundreds of messages yesterday and today is there an extension today everybody is forwarding yes there is an extension so what you get out of the entire process is only a tarikh pe tarikh one extension after another extension so recently there was an interaction that we were uh, having in the office and uh, the question that was asked is that what happened to gstr2 and what happened to gstr3 so somewhere uh, you know we were trying to call out that particular notification which said that the date will be decided and notified sometime in future so one of the notifications that i put up the one in the middle actually has that text okay it will be notified to you in future and that future i don't know whether it is close or it's never going to come so what were the uh, challenges that most of us faced very very briefly to put it uh, uh, you know rather than uh, blaming somebody pointing uh, fingers one thing that we need to understand that the gstn has always been in a state of flux forever whenever you look at them they say that you know we we are making this change we are making that change we are trying to resolve this process we are trying to resolve that process every time you raise a ticket they come back to you and say that we have resolved this issue but you don't know what they have resolved and where they have resolved some of the interactions that we have had with the asps uh, and some gsps we have been told that they at times they are so afraid of making any change or doing something is because they are worried 
that if we change one thing, they will create a problem somewhere else. So now considering that this is such a huge system, considering that there is such a complex amount of calculation and so many validations that are there in place, something or the other is bound to, uh, you know, get missed out. I mean, no matter what checklist you might have, with everything that you follow as a process, you need time, you need patience and you need diligence. From what we understand that there were so many change requests from the government itself. It's like at one point of time, they would have been told that, please do this. And just as they are ready to launch, the government would have said, no, no, scrap this. Please go back to the old one. The classic example uh, being that uh, the government said that, please give one time access and one time option where people can say whether you want to file it on a monthly basis or on a quarterly basis. And as the interface was created, so many people made mistakes and they wanted to revert back to the one that they were already following. So, uh, for instance, somebody wanted to go to a quarterly period and by default did not click it, went on to monthly and he could not go back to quarterly at all and vice versa. The worst thing was that they said that when we had to actually tabulate and see whether or not you are uh, compliant or not, it was a bit of a nightmare for them also. So, I'm not blaming anybody, but I'm just saying that there were circumstances due to which uh, the GSTN has never really stabilized. Apart from that, given the uh, volume of data that they are supposed to handle and which they are required to handle on a month to month basis, there have been constant instances where uh, there has been outages in the system. Uh, either the systems are not talking or the data is not getting captured. In fact, uh, from what I understand, there are situations that somebody has uploaded the data and at a later date found out that the return filing status is saying not filed or the figures that are there appearing on the uh, database are completely different. Now, some of them have actually dragged the GST into the court also to say that how can you do that? You're not supposed to alter what data I have uploaded. In their defense, they have said that if you have uploaded something, don't worry, it is there somewhere in the system. That signed document is always there. It is just a matter of finding it. Whether they will find it or not, uh, we'll have to see in future. I'm not saying that it is an impossible thing, but it is a humongous task because it's like finding a needle in the haystack. It's not so simple. I mean, you might have heard all those stories where you say that, you know, if you wanted to find a needle in the haystack, why didn't you take a magnet and go and find it? You might have those stories, but it's not as simple as that. Apart from that, when you look at it for the taxpayers and for the uh, consultants, one of the problems has been that there are multiple levels and multiple types of compliances and uh, the compliance process itself is so lengthy. In order to reach to your result, you have to first take out the raw data, thereafter massage the data, thereafter validate the data, after validating, upload it in the template. If there is something wrong, you know, some wrong character has come in, the data goes for a complete toss. After uploading, you find that the data is not correct. In fact, uh, we had one situation where uh, we were uploading uh, um, returns of a service provider and that service provider had uh, provided services to ISD recipients. About two months back, the uh, experience was so uh, nerve wracking. Every time they would try to upload and submit the data, they would be hit by a error message saying there are a couple of invoices which you need to accept or reject and resolve the error. And they did that process over and over again, over and over again. The return went late by a couple of days. After maybe seven or eight days, when they finally thought that they have finished everything, they submitted the return. They were about to sign it with the DSC. And again, they got another error. So this was something again, uh, which the GSTN uh, did not anticipate. They were candid enough to say that, you know, this was uh, completely out of the blue. They are saying that uh, they're going to be resolving this particular issue also. But the fact of the matter is just imagine the experience that I talked to you about was GSTR 6. If GSTR 2 was actually in play, think of what would happen to your return. You would never be able to get out of it. Every time you tried to upload your GSTR 3, you would get some or the other error which would say that you need to resolve it. So what picture we have seen was just a small trailer of what could have been had the GSTR 2 and 3 been real. Apart from that, there, has been, there have been uh, several instances where there is lack of clarity. There is no stability or uh, there is no one, con one thought on what the position will be. Your situation, if you see prior to the proposed amendments, how you will treat high C sales, 
whether or not you can utilize your uh, CGST credit, SGST credit in any order that you choose. I'm talking about these two specific instances because in both these cases there is a proposed amendment wherein the government has now taken a position that you can proceed in a particular manner. There are several such open issues which they have not yet addressed. But the fact of the matter is that everybody expected that you should have had that clarity at least on day one. If not day, on day one, you should have had it somewhere in between. And had you told the taxpayers what to do, then you would not be facing this situation. Now, one year down the line, if you change the position and tell me that you need to pay interest and penalty on this, that's not going to happen. I mean, it's a very, very uh, difficult and very uh, hard burden that you put on me. Apart from that, uh, I'm sure uh, most of you by now would have uh, received some or the other letter. I'm saying letter, I'm not saying notices because in most cases you have received a letter, you have received an intimation. Some cases you have received a uh, notice. They are issuing notices mechanically to say there is a mismatch between your GSTR uh, 3B versus GSTR 1. There is a mismatch between GSTR 3 and 2A, you claim more credit. Now, when they give it to you or when they send you that notice, they send it to you as one single line item to say that between this period to this period, this is what you have shown, this is what we are seeing and the figure is mismatching. The law as a process requires them to actually give you invoice-wise details, but they give you a summarized detail. Now, how will you find out what is the difference? GSTR 3B and 3, 1, you can stay, say it is still in your control. But if you look at GSTR 2A, that's a moving target. Every day somebody might be uploading some data. If you saw some data yesterday and you see some data today, you will see that there is a difference. How do you reconcile that? How do you know which figure he saw on what day versus what figure you are seeing today? Whether How did he come to that figure? There is no way to find out. There is no visibility. If you look at your own selves in your office, there is a severe uh, crunch when it comes to resources. I mean, anybody and everybody who has been in the uh, uh, process of compliance, I don't know, I would ask you, how many breaks have you taken? Have you taken a, a vacation more than three days? Anybody? <laughs> so I remember telling one of my clients, actually, that uh, when GSCR2 was going to be... Uh, initiated. I said that considering the number of transactions and so we are talking about about 4 lakh transactions which he had to reconcile in a period of 5 days and he had a team of about 20 people. I said if you break it up you will need to clear as many as 2 or 3 invoices per minute in a 10 hour working day without a break and no absenteeism. We had one customer who actually uh, one client who told us that you know now that everything is going to be centralized uh, probably I don't need so many people. I need to reduce my team. When we gave him the statistics, he said, I never thought of all this. Maybe I'll have to hire two or three people more just as backup. Because you never know, you know, uh, there might be something that uh, people might have to face and they might not turn up to work. What will you do? Some people may not have a very huge liability, but others, they have a very huge liability. And for every day, the interest that you pay might be a tidy sum. It will be a small fortune. Can you afford to take that kind of a chance? The client is relying on you. Can you afford to let him down? He will never come back to you. Apart from that, you need to invest in hardware and software. Uh, before the session started, we were just uh, chit-chatting and we were saying that, you know, the ASPs and the GSPs are a very, very, uh, uh, I would say, a lot of for which you would have a lot of sympathy. The reason being because practically every month, whatever they have done in the previous month, literally speaking, goes down the drain. Because they have done something and then GSTN comes and says, okay, now this has been scrapped. You need to do something different. This validation was there, but that is not there. In fact, I remember having one discussion with uh, our ASP and he said that, yes, yes, there is. So what they had done is that this was during the initial days of uh, GSTR 3B. And the instance was that... Uh, they had changed the offline utility for filing 3B. Now, something that they changed in that also impacted the utility for GSTR 1. And it was supposed to impact only the offline utility, but because of the validations that they put in, even the people who were actually going through the ASPs started facing a problem. When they called up GSTN, they said, yes, yes, we know there is a problem. 
but we don't know where it is. Now, I don't know whether it is a fact or not, but that is the response that we got. Now, you imagine there is so many things that they are looking at. If they want to resolve it in that, if they can't resolve it in a five-day period, how do you resolve it in five-day period? So, everybody is constantly required to upgrade their hardware, their software. And considering that if you're doing multiple compliances, if you're doing it under uh, the company law, you're doing it under income tax. From what I hear from some of my friends is that, you know, if you want to do company law uh, related compliances, you need a PC, which is an old PC, which is going to handle uh, Excel 2007, Windows 7. Only then you will be able to do a compliance. If you want to do GST compliance and you want to do uh, matching of J, uh, you know, J1, J2, sorry, the uh, GSTR2 details, I have been recommending to people that you should get the latest version of Excel because there are several options available in that which you can use it. And my friend said that if I do that, I'll have to stop all other work. I know of other people who say that, you know, this PC is for company law, this PC is for income tax, and that PC is for GST. Now, I don't know how many small time consultants can afford to have this kind of a luxury. Anyways, apart from that, uh, taxpayers have an onerous burden for every mistake that you make. Uh, there is a huge impact of interest. You have to answer to so many queries from the department, even for the smallest things. I mean, uh, be it EV bill, be it uh, your GSTR returns, for the smallest of things. I, in fact, today morning I was talking to one of our clients and uh, his team member said that, you know, the chance of this error happening is 0.05%. It was just a statistic that he threw to us to say it's a 0.5%. I said, uh, can you open up the notice that you got day before yesterday? Uh, so he has received a notice from the uh, Gujarat uh, state authorities wherein they have said that there is a mismatch between his GSTR 3B and GSTR 1. I said, please open up that particular notice and read the figures that they have given. I don't know how many of you have noticed it, but the figure that they gave was with a six decimal point accuracy. So apart from the fact that when you compare it, you see that it is a 5000.000001 rupee difference. And my man is telling me that, you know, there's a 0.5% chance that I will make a mistake. They are tracking it to that level and he, this is the uncertainty that we have to face. Now, on one hand, they are trying to reduce litigation to say that, you know, this is not material enough. And on the other hand, they are raising notices for such small amounts also. Moving on. What are the challenges? What are the changes that uh, we had recommended to GSTM? We said that the present com process is very, very complex. The system is very, very rigid. It is inflexible and there are several instances that you need to consider before you can proceed on this. If you keep it so difficult, compliance is not going to be easy. There are going to be defaults, rank and file. You will not have many people who will be able to fully comply even though they want to comply. There is a very lengthy process which is involved in compliance. You need to make it simpler because the manner in which you are going about with it, there are several people who are not very big. They are very small. They have meager resources. For them to follow this process is not very easy. They don't have discipline. They don't have uh, educated. They don't have informed persons who will be able to follow through the process. Not everybody can afford to hire a chartered accountant. In fact, from what I remember, in one of the meetings uh, when GST was being implemented, a very high-ranking officer uh, happened to comment publicly to say it is these chartered accountants who are creating so much negativity about this process. He was actually pulled up in public to say that you are wrong. You need to sit and do this process. In fact, I remember from... Uh, uh, some of the old uh, news articles that some commissioners were actually told that you please sit and try and file the return. And if you are able to file the return, then we will accept it is our fault. And as it turned out, they were not even able to upload one single return. So imagine at that point of time, they were saying the CAs are wrong. Now the government is saying GSTN let us down. GSTN is saying the government has let us down. So on, so forth. 
but the fact of the matter is that nobody is recognizing that the process is so lengthy you are asking for so much amount of information you should have taken a step by step approach before going to that level sufficient time needs to be given for compliance i mentioned to you that this client of mine has data and within 5 day period he has to do that compliance i mean he has no choice if he doesn't he will either lose out on credit or he will not be filing a correct return and who at the end of the day the government is going to say you know you had everything in your possession why didn't you file a return in fact i recall a case uh, delivered by i think uh, i'm not sure the cstat uh, just 2 uh, or 3 days ago in case of uh, sifi and this case was uh, in the matter where uh, sifi has not paid service tax on the tds amount which was withheld by their customer and their argument to the uh, uh, tribunal was that please do not levy a penalty because there was a problem in our software we did not record this and we didn't know about it as soon as we came to know we have paid it and the cstat has given a ruling to say that the software did not have the capability or there was a mistake in the software is not an excuse and you are liable to pay penalty now those are the circumstances under which we have to work the reconciliation and the matching process is not so easy it needs to be simplified while they kept on saying that uh, you know it will be auto populated and you will be able to do it i don't know how many of you have actually tried to do a matching of uh, the data between the 2a and your own purchase register so there are several tools which are available but if you are doing it manually trust me it's a huge exercise and it depends on the it depends on the people who have supplied goods and services it's on the team which has actually recorded those uh inward supplies if there is even one item missing in the data be it the date be it the invoice number if he has clubbed two invoices together and put it or if he has recorded the value in a different manner you are going to be uh head over heels trying to match the data we have been doing it for some people and i can tell you sometimes people who are disciplined you are able to do it immediately the other people you can keep on working hours and hours you can keep on sifting through data and you'll never be able to do it so there was a small code that i wrote for a client of ours and we tried to match it it worked beautifully up to a certain point of time but when it was common date and common amounts or if it was just common amounts over a period of time you would still never get that data so you need to be very careful this is something that has already been highlighted but the government is not really paying attention to it another thing that uh, we have been asking the government is please give us the option to rectify the returns in vat you had an option to revise the returns in service tax you had the option to revise the returns but in gst there is no option to revise the return in fact there would have been several instances i think in many of our clients almost every month you will have some or the other mismatch between gst r1 and 3b now the reason why you have a uh, mismatch between 3b and 1 is that you are trying to rectify the earlier periods return now imagine you made a mistake once that will cascade into the next month you rectified it in that month but you left out something else that will cascade into next month and for each of these three months you will get a separate notice and you have to sit and explain to somebody who doesn't want to be reasonable with you several times we have placed this request that you should allow us to revise the returns but they have not heeded the other and uh, most important uh part of the gst filing return is the input tax credit and that is at the heart of the entire process the reason why you are uploading so much amount of data is because the government is saying that we want to have full control about what is the tax liability what is the input tax credit which is available only those items which match we will allow and for this matching process they say that if the recipient has claimed it but the supplier has not uploaded the data then you have 2 months maximum to get it resolved if not then the credit will be reversed now there have been several instances where representations have gone to the government to say that you know what is the mistake of the recipient why are you placing such a onerous burden in fact uh, one of the reasons why this was put up in the representation is the classic example that was given to the government was you look at the tds provisions in income tax of course it has taken some time to uh, come to the position that it is today but under tds there are two things which any 
person who has received money whose tds has been withheld by the payer is certain about number 1 if the tax has been deducted he will definitely get the credit at some point point of time or the other in fact the law actually provides that if the tax has been deducted and it has not been deposited then the deductee at the most will not be granted the credit at the most he will not be granted credit but no recovery will be done of that amount there is a specific provision in income tax the income tax law goes on further to say that at any point of time if that person pays it he agrees to it you will get the credit there is no interest there is no penalty burden on you but you look at the gst provisions they have of course taken a leaf from uh, maharashtra mahalakshmi cotton wherein they have not only imposed a burden of interest but there is a likelihood of penalty also coming and visiting you to say that you have claimed credit without any basis in fact when you look at the proposed amendment they have gone so far as to say that the recipient and the supplier both of them are jointly and severally liable now that to my mind is very very onerous it's very very harsh some of the suggestions that we gave to the government i'm sorry the font is very small but i try to squeeze everything on one screen uh some of the suggestions that we gave to the government is that first of all you know get rid of the uh multiple returns you need to have one single return the fact that people have to file three returns is creating a lot of problems so the government kept on saying that you are actually filing only one return you are filing it in three parts so of course today also you are not going to be any different when you look at the new formats you are still going to be doing the same thing but in a different manner the second thing that was uh, requested from the government is that let there be a statement of itc mismatch this was a suggestion which went through from bcs we said that you know why don't you allow there to be a process wherein first of all let the taxpayers claim it on a self assessment basis thereafter you provide the data we will come up with a statement which is a itc mismatch statement and on that basis thereafter you can make whatever efforts are there to recover if it is not recovered then we will look at what has to be done another request was that please do away with the interest burden as far as we are concerned we have paid the tax the fact that that fellow has defaulted you cannot penalize me for that you can't cast the burden on me when you look at the proposed amendment and not the bill in the proposed amendment they had somewhere uh, said no that was uh, 162 but this interest burden has still remained the other thing that was requested is that you look at the periodicity please change the periodicity please make it quarterly here to the government was saying this is not possible you know there is a revenue consideration if you make it quarterly it might not happen then the fact was that that why don't you make it quarterly for smaller taxpayers so if you go back to the uh, image that i shown to you you had cars and you had two wheelers that's the smaller taxpayers i mean if you look at the uh, matrix of taxpayers in uh, gstn in terms of numbers the small taxpayers out uh, they outnumber the large taxpayers in terms of tax payment it is the large taxpayers who actually pay more tax than the smaller taxpayers so the government was told that why don't you get into a situation where the smaller taxpayers are told to file returns less frequently that way you will reduce the traffic that way you will reduce the burden and at the same time you know you will have achieved your objective of getting the returns now the question was who is the small taxpayer so the our suggestion was that you know why don't you keep the definition of a small taxpayer in line with what the other laws are you make an sme somebody with a turnover of less than 50 crore rupees that way you will have brought down almost 80% of the people in the quarterly bracket another another suggestion that went through was uh, you know please don't ask us to upload the data please don't ask us to do a reconciliation let it be unidirectional now this was again based on the tds experience where you, if you look at it the system is very very stable uh, they have several controls in place for all practical purposes the deductee is able to claim the credit of whatever taxes have been withheld the onus has onus and the burden has been put up on the 
deductor. There is no process of matching, there is no process of claiming, there is no process of accept reject and then too that system is working perfectly in income tax. This was a suggestion which went through, please keep it at one level, don't keep it at two levels. Of course, if you keep it at two levels, I give you the example of what happened in GSTR 6. That is a very, very uh, distinct possibility. The other suggestion was that please allow us to make uh, periodic amendments to the returns, periodic amendments to the ITC so that you know it doesn't become a very heavy burden. So let's see how far this process is helping us. Now what I'm talking to you about is uh, the new returns. To begin with, when you look at the returns, there are three specific parts that you need to look at. Okay, Every return comes with a questionnaire, it comes with an annexure, and then you have the main return. Now, uh, during one of, our, one of our interactions with the uh, GST and CEO, he said that you know when we had originally proposed the uh, return filing process, we said that let it be a questionnaire based process because what will happen is that if you allow us to put a questionnaire, we'll have the right tables tabulated and only the relevant tables will come up. That way, these people don't have to bother about the other tables. Okay, so to that extent, they have kept the questionnaire. In terms of the process, you are first supposed to fill up the annexure. Basis the annexure, the return will be auto populated. Okay, we will look at the annexures, we will look at the returns also. First, let us look at what are the two or three new things that they have introduced. Okay. Uh, I'm just keeping the slide in this particular format because otherwise I'll not be able to switch the documents. Okay. First of all, what they have done is that they have defined different classes of taxpayers and they have defined the periodicity for the taxpayers. Okay. They have defined that there will be a monthly return, there will be a quarterly return. The quarterly return will be restricted to those people who have a turnover of less than 5 crore rupees. Apart from your uh, monthly and quarterly return, what they have also said that you will have two separate returns which is the Sahaj and the Sugam return. The idea behind the Sahaj and the Sugam return is that ultimately if somebody doesn't need to upload all the data then there is no need to go through the entire return. Right at the outset you answer the relevant questions and the form will be generated. If you say that I'm a trader, I'm not making any B2B supplies, I'm making only B2C supplies, there is no need for that person to give so many lines of data or at least scroll through them that much amount of information. Just give the B2C data and you are done with it. If you say I'm making B2C plus B2B data, uh, information to a certain extent, then you have a smaller return. But if you say that I am actually doing a lot of business, I have a lot of B2B supplies, I have a lot of B2C supplies, I have exports, I have SEZ uh, related transactions, I have deemed uh, export transactions, then you have to go through the full-fledged return. In order to reach the returns, you need to first fill up the questionnaire. So what does the questionnaire look like? Is it uh, visible to you right up to the end? So it asks you some very basic questions. Do you have B2C supplies? Do you have B2B supplies? Have you made exports uh, with payment of tax? Have you made exports without payment of tax? Have you made supplies to SEZ units or developers with or without payment of tax? Have you supplied uh, 
to people and has it been considered as a deemed export do you have services or supplies invert supplies which attract reverse charge have you imported services have you imported goods this is a separate detail that they are asking have you imported goods from scz on bill of entry so this form is actually in public domain so you can just take it from there there is no need to take a snap uh, has your supplier uploaded invoice has no has sorry has your supplier not uploaded invoices on which you have claimed input credit for two tax periods so this is something which is new okay and the next thing have you made any supplies through e-commerce portals you need to know that by default answer to each and every one of this question is no you have to elect to say yes okay by default each and every answer is no you have to elect to say yes if you say yes then the uh, right table will be activated so for those of you who have been filing uh, st3 returns under service tax in the last two years you would have noted that when you started first of all you needed to give your uh, service tax registration number you had to give whether you are a firm or you are a company depending on your input it would create a table which would have either a quarterly liability or a, a quarterly reporting or a monthly reporting you would actually have to select to say what are the different services that you are opting for depending on that there would be a separate tab which would be opened you actually had to select to say whether i am a recipient of service or i am a provider of service am i availing a notification benefit or i am not availing a benefit of a notification depending on all of that the validations used to take place to a certain extent this is going down the same logic that depending on what you respond or what you provide as an input it will allow you to access a table or not okay now what you are seeing on the screen is the main annexure okay the first part is fairly standard it is no different than what you see in your gstr 3b the only different thing which appears uh, is your trade name your arn and date of arn which of course will be available after the return has been filed okay now when you look at the table per se the columns that you are looking at are more or less the same as they were in your gstr 1 there is hardly any difference it is more or less the same thing at the most what they have done is that they have shifted the columns from the right to the left so your classic place being your place of supply so they have linked it just next to the gstr number otherwise all the other data that you are putting the only one data or rather two data which are missing in this column is your hsn number and unit of measure the quantitative details what they have on the screen what they have put in the form is all that information that you need to match your invoices of course you don't match your place of supply you match your gstin and you match the now document number the date the value the taxes paid so on and so forth but that's all those are the main columns that are there okay you need to give in separate parts of the table supplies made to consumers and unregistered persons supplied made to registered persons other than those attracting reverse charge exports without payment exports with payment supplies to scz with payment without payment now for all practical purposes in gstr 1 scz supplies were clubbed with supplies with b2b now you have a separate table for this so that's just a cosmetic change it's not much of a change after the outward supply you have all the reverse charge uh, related and inward supply related data again the information if you see the headings of the table remains the same there is no change so you have to first provide data of inward supplies uh, on which reverse charge is applicable import of services import of goods import of goods from scz on a bill of entry and 3l is the new item now mind you this would have normally been part of your gstr 2 or probably 3 mostly 2 because that's where the details of your uh, input credit were being tabulated that was that's where the details of your invert supplies were being tabulated now this is forming part of your annexure you are giving this details separately for all practical purposes under the old routine this was going to be auto populated and this would have been added to your output tax liability 
because after you would have matched they would have checked it within their system if there was a mismatch then after 2 months there would be a auto reversal now to this extent they have said missing invoices on which credit has been claimed in t minus 2 means that tax period minus 2 2 two months prior and the supplier has not reported the same till the date of filing this return so if you go through the uh, explanatory notes which are available what they are saying is that you may file it in this month you are allowed a two month period to get your supplier to upload his data if he uploads his data then you will be able to claim the credit but if he has not uploaded in two months then you need to do a reversal of course you have all those questions that what happens to uh, persons who are uploading on a quarterly basis we'll come to the return filing and the uh, filling up of the annexer a little differently i mean uh, after some time i just want to go through the annexes to say first what data you are going to upload okay then you have uh, data related to supplies made through e-commerce operators where tcs is collected and of course the most hated hsn summary i mean um, so one of the things which was asked to them uh, just after the forms were released that why are you so obsessed with hsn in fact now hsn has gone to a different level uh the reason being because if you look at uh, the old uh, notifications which are there they said that if you have a turnover less than a certain amount you don't need to uh, keep track of hsn you don't need to mention hsn if you have a turnover up to a certain limit you need to talk about two digits beyond that you need to keep four digits of course on the field when you go to see uh, when you're looking at the data in some commodities you have a situation where for the same four digit hsn you might have a different rate and if you try to fill it up in the return you would not be able to up upload it at which point of time you were forced to put either 5 6 7 or 8 digits so that you could have it so there are some people uh, where they had three different rates for the same goods or rather for the same hsn and they had three different hsns which they used to put in the summary but these are all large players what happens to smaller players they were till now being exempted but now the mandate is that everybody needs to fill up this hsn summary everybody needs to fill up four digits of hsn you need to keep track and you need to upload it during our conversation with the uh, gstn ceo he said that we were asked recently that why, can you give us data about this particular hsn and uh, we want to see what is the variance which is coming in the data he said when we pulled out the data and we tried to match it rate wise or the category of uh, supplies which were being made and in in many places it made absolutely no sense it made absolutely no sense recently we came across one situation a cl client of ours asked that you please tell me what is the uh, hsn or the sac for a particular invoice that he sent to us he said we are taking a factory along with plant and machinery on rent please tell me what is the hsn there was a internal debate going on that uh, should i quote the hsn for the renting of the property or should i quote the hsn for the renting of the machine i asked him do you have a separate consideration do you have one single consideration he said it's a one single consideration it is for both there is no way that i am going to separate it there is no need for me to separate it i said you are not covered in either of the two hsns you please go to the residuary category not that it makes any difference the rate of tax remains the same but when you are reporting what will you report you want to be as precise as possible but they have not really thought about these situations what do you do you are bound to get some or the other answer which is going to be off the track then comes the verification so for the first time ever uh, at least as far as uh, the return filing scenario is concerned across legislations be it income tax be it uh, service tax vat excise and now gst for the first time ever tax payers will be given a facility that if you want to file a nil return you can file a nil return by sending an sms now many people will say you know that such a convenient uh, gesture that has been or such a convenient feature that has been provided for all i need to do is just file an sms 
is it that simple i mean for all practical purposes of course they have the uh, you will be able to do that only from one single phone smaller tech players whether they will maintain that phone they will not maintain that phone that is a question mark of course they will have to be more disciplined enough but they will be able to do it now your second thing that you look at if you look at any return that you file whether you file it electronically whether you file it manually at the bottom of every return you have this verification statement when i send an sms am i going to be giving this verification am i going to be signing this how are you going to, how is the government going to ensure that whatever i have stated is right or not i can very easily say that you know uh my 5 year old son picked up the phone and he just sent that sms what do i do kids nowadays are smart they can unlock the phone and they can just randomly send without realizing what the repercussions can be i mean who takes responsibility for that somebody might say that you know i had left my phone unattended and some uh, disgruntled employee of mine sent that sms you can have several situations there is no provision for that the fact of the matter is that there is no provision whatsoever to say that when that sms has been sent it is verified let's come back to what are some of the novel features that the return has got okay of course like you are providing currently you will provide the details of outward supplies imports inward supplies those attracting reverse charge there are detailed instructions given for that depending on what you fill in the annexure what you saw in front of you this was the annexure now this annexure will be available to you for all practical purposes the one big change that is now going to happen when these returns are implemented is that you will be able to upload data on a day to day basis on a real time basis so if you are geared enough you might have a situation you raise the bill and it has gone and been saved on the gstn you can have that situation also the reason why they have done it so one of the things that uh, we hear that while the government says that you know we have solved your problem we have allowed you to uh, upload data on a real time basis whatever data you upload on a real time basis will be available to your customer on a real time basis fact of the matter is that when you go to see the process it may not be as simple as that because right now the interface is not yet available but the real problem that they have solved is their own they have not solved any of our problems the problem that they have solved is the traffic jam on the last few days of filing one of the biggest problems that large taxpayers had is that you expect me to file my gstr 1 by the 10th by the time my accounts are done by the time my mis is done by the time i am able to arrive at a figure it is the 5th of the month in 5 days or maybe less and we have a couple of customers who actually give us the data only on the last date because they have to collate data from five different sources by the time it comes to them there are several checks that they want to do they want to ensure that all their gls are perfectly matching they are very very sensitive they don't want to upload anything which is incorrect they are very very sensitive we have to upload within time but they will give me the data on the last date after lunch only now even then we try and help them as much as possible and they appreciate it they never say no they say that you are been there we appreciate it you people are taking effort how do we speed up so far as we are concerned you know we can at the most tell them that you know on a daily basis you will be now be able to upload it this facility was not really available earlier it could have been done but it was not really really available now they can do it in a situation where they can upload it on a daily basis there are some instances where uh, uh, in some cases we often tease some of our colleagues that you please upload your data last because the moment you upload your data all our returns will be stuck the system will be jammed please wait for us to upload you do it last the reason being because large amounts of data takes a lot of time there have been time when we have been telling our customers that you please split up your data there is no need for you to upload it if you upload it together there are so many checks which will happen 
the same data which would normally take you half an hour to upload will get uploaded in two hours time. Why do you want to waste two hours instead of half an hour? He said, I don't want to take a risk. I don't want to create a separate table. If there is some mistake in splitting the table and uploading the data, and if something gets missed out, who's responsible? I don't want to sit and reconcile. I don't want to maintain separate data. This is the output report I'm getting. Everything is fitting fine. I want you to upload it as it is. For those kind of customers, this feature will be perfect to say that, okay, you got it ready. Let us check it. Let us, let us upload it. Of course, there is a, a marker available within the GSTN so that you cannot upload duplicate data. To that extent, you are safe on that part. But mind you, you are uploading data on a real-time basis. If there is a mistake, it is uploaded as it is. And if for whatever be the reason, your customer has seen the data and he has accepted it, that invoice is locked. So real time upload has real time problems also. Whatever you upload will ultimately get summarized and auto populated in the main return. So when you, what you're seeing on the screen is the main return, which is a summary of whatever you have uploaded in the annexure. Okay. For all practical purposes, there is a correlation that it is coming from some table and it says the value is automatic. Okay. There are some parts where it is not automatic. So most of the details that you have in your outward supply will be automatic. Details as regards your advances, any advances received, any adjustment of advances, that is going to be a manual exercise. Now, for all practical purposes, it is just one figure that you have to punch in, but you still need to have a reconciliation of what were the advances received earlier, what you have adjusted in the current period. If it was received in the current period and adjusted in the current period, definitely you will not uh, provide for it here. But if it were, there was a... Uh, Skipping in the period, that is to say you received advance earlier and in the next month you adjusted it, this is where you will have to report it. The next part that you have to report manually is details of exempt and nil rated supplies, your non-GSC supplies and no supply as per Schedule 3, Section 7. This is a new entry which has come into the returns. This was not there earlier. Okay. Same way if you go to see... In the invert supply also, most of the data is auto-populated. So somewhere when you're looking at it, it gives you the reminder of what GSTR2 was supposed to be. The GSTR2 which they said will work and which has till date not worked. When you look at the GSTR2A also to a certain extent, you're not very happy about the data that you get in that. So most of the data that you had your supplier had provided will get auto populated out over here we will there is one more annexure which is related to inward supplies on how the data related to inward supplies is going to be tabulated how you will accept reject i'll just come to that in a minute i just wanted to point out which are the supplies which are going to be manual uh, manual data entry So the first amount is the one that you will actually fill manually for the first time when you fill the first return. After that, it is going to be auto-populated. So what this basically means is that if you look at uh, Section 16 of the CGST Act, it says that you are entitled to take the credit only when you have, number one, the invoice in your possession, when you have received the goods or services, when you have... Uh, uh, you know, the opposite person has filed the returns. When you have filed your returns, he has paid the tax, so on and so forth. Now, one question that uh, uh, has been a matter of debate, and in fact, yesterday at the study circle, we were, uh, we were having a good debate on that, 
was that when you look at certain supplies and specifically in case of services whether you will claim the credit as soon as you get the invoice or not so two classic examples that you can talk about bcs is conducting a seminar and for the seminar you have paid certain fees this is one example take another example you are traveling from uh, say bombay to uh, let's say lahore you want to attend um, imran khan's uh, swearing in ceremony like mr siddu and you had purchased a ticket and at the last minute you realize that you know there is some problem and you don't want to travel now you have paid for the ticket you have paid taxes on that the ticket is non refundable can you say i have received the service should you be claiming this now that is one question you take the example of bcs bcs is holding a seminar 15 days from now i paid the services i paid for the uh, seminar today i have received a kit can i say i have received the service should i be filling up this should i be claiming it or should i say that this is an invoice that i have received but i have not received the service or i have not received the goods therefore i'll carry it forward to the next month you you might face those problems once we start filing this return this was one piece of information which was not being asked from us when we were filing the returns in the current scenario now you will be required to answer this question now this is a auto populated item which will come from your previous return but in the first return you will have to file it on your own so this is one in piece of information that you will actually have to capture separately next is import of goods from scz units and supplies not uploaded by suppliers now they have provided for this one needs to see what information you will provide out over here and how much detail you will provide out over here is this going to be a situation where you can actually say that these are the suppliers whom you need to pursue and go and take uh, you know collect the tax from them or is it going to be that these are the suppliers that i have received that will has not uploaded the data you straight away go and deny the credit for me we'll have to see how it works out the next thing is supplies not eligible for credit including isd credits so this is again a self reporting mechanism where you need to uh, say which are the credits that i am not eligible to take supplies uploaded by suppliers on which credit has already been claimed in the previous tax period so in the earlier part of the uh, uh, annexure we saw the last item in the annexure which said that those supplies wherein on a t minus 2 basis the supplier has not uploaded the data and you are claiming the credit so just think about it in the month of april you received a supply you upload you uploaded the data of the supply received in the month of april your supplier did not upload it in april he did not upload it in may but he definitely uploaded it in june now that is something that you will report out over here that you have already claimed that credit and you are not going to claim it again this is the uh, converse of the first item that we saw supplies on which credit is available but i have not received the goods or services so for all practical purposes what you fill up over here will be carried forward to the next month and it will be available to you otherwise in all practical purposes this is a self reported item any reversals of input tax credit on account of 37 39 42 and 43 you will have to put out over here other itc including adjustment of itc on account of trans, uh, transition from composition to normal again is a manual input that you will put the net effect of all the credits will be auto calculated but it will remain to be a editable figure so again you will be able to change that figure in case there is a different figure input tax credit on account of capital goods reporting only for not credited to electronic credit ledger so this we'll have to see what are these because if these are normal supplies from a domestic supplier they should always get reported probably these are imports but even if it is import it should have come by way of a bill of entry one will need to see what this pertains to then the usual items like uh, tds and tcs credits received interest payment interest liability and then finally uh, the payment of tax table and this you are all familiar this is the same table that you see in 3b 
it's no different from that if you claimed any refund then adjustment of that and the verification now let's go very quickly to the annexure related to inward supplies again this is like gstr2 where they have said most of the details will be auto drafted you will get supplies from somebody else's uh, gstr1 and gstr5 and 6 also most of it is auto populated if you see the table out over here it is far more detailed compared to what you give in your outward supply the two or three things that they have added out over here is they have added the trader's name okay so one common complaint which everybody had is that uh, you know you are giving me data on a gstin basis but i don't know who the trader is and there have been instances where you know i have attributed gstin to some some other trader also so one of the exercises that we do when we are doing a matching of gstr uh, 2a versus over purchase register we first look at the gstin numbers and validate it to see okay whether the name captured is the same name or is it a different name we also try and see that if the same gstin has multiple names attached to it or multiple names or one particular name has got multiple gstins attached to it we try to understand whether or not there is any duplication of data or there is error in capturing of data to a certain extent you might not need to do that exercise because you will get the data straight off uh, from the gstin itself now apart from that you have the accept reject column available just next to your inward supplies so the manner in which the process has been described uh, in the commentary it says that this data will come to you auto populated there is no question of you adding any missing supplies only that which comes into your ledger you will be able to claim that there is no question of you adding any more whatever comes you have three options accept reject or keep pending if you keep pending it will get carried forward to the next period if you accept it will add to your credit if you reject there is no question of getting credit you will get credit of only those invoices which you actually accept now apart from accepting the credit you need to put the value of how much credit you are claiming so if the credit flowing to you is 100 rupees but you are claiming credit of only 50 rupees then you actually need to manually punch in that data so let's take the example of bank practically everything that they receive is at 50% will they be putting in 50% for practically each and every invoice banks nbfcs are classic case in point let's take another situation you might have a, a situation where you have paid only in part to your supplier you will have to put that manually you will actually need to identify each and every item and thereafter punch in the data to say this is this i am taking only part credit so you will punch in data for all the services received from uh, registered persons for supplies received from ssets on bill of entry on import of goods you should normally get most of this data through the system itself ice gate is going to be linked your all the other uh, databases are also going to be linked then the isd credits again over here also you have to say what you are accepting what you are rejecting depending on what you fill out over here all this data will go and sit in the main return now the manner in which the process has been described and i'm sure all of you you are familiar with the dates while i can keep on uploading my data on a day to day basis the data will keep on getting added to my database it will keep on getting added to my return for that particular tax period on the 10th of the month there is a cut off whatever data is uploaded for that month up to the 10th of that month will get calculated as my outward liability what i upload on the 11th will become part of next month's credit for the recipient it will still be a part of this month's liability and i'll have to pay it with interest if i don't pay it on time so you will have a situation where while it gets calculated for all tax purposes and interest purposes in the same month 
in which I have raised the invoice but uploaded the data after the 10th. But my recipient will get the credit only in the next month, not in the same month. So to a certain extent, if you go to see, this is the same thing that you had in GSTR 1 also. What you upload up to the 10th will flow into that fellow's credit by the 11th. What you upload up to 10th will be auto drafted in the annexure for inward supplies by the 11th. You have 10 days to accept or reject and thereafter come to your liability. So what really has changed apart from everything else is that you got only 5 days more to do your accept reject. The data that you have to compile is more or less the same. The amount of pain that you will have to go through to verify the data is the same. Only thing you got 5 days more. So that was one small request that we asked that give us more time that they have accepted. Whether that's going to be practical or not, that one needs to see. Now, in the accept reject scenario also, what they have said is that by default, everything will be accept. You actually have to elect and say it is reject or it is pending. By default, it is going to be accept. So to that extent, they are saying that, you know, we have reduced your burden. Now, you might have situation, you know, among 10,000 invoices, there is one particular supply which you never received. And you went and accepted it. The poor fellow who has actually supplied to you or rather supplied to somebody else will not be able to amend it unless you unlock it. The moment you accept it or deemed acceptance, the invoice will get locked. He cannot change it. So your action as well as inaction will cause problem to somebody else. You have to be very careful on that. Let's have a look at the other two returns, which are the smaller returns, which is the Sahaj and the Sugam. Any question, uh, whatever questions we have got as far as the filing process is concerned, let's take it up after 10 minutes. Very quickly, I'll run through the Sahaj and Sugam. The quarterly return also to a larger extent is more or less the same. There is not much of a difference. Only difference is that as far as the person covered under the quarterly liability, he has to pay his taxes on a monthly basis, but he has to file his return on a quarterly basis. So to a certain extent, you are going to be uh, like the service tax regime where you paid your taxes on a monthly basis, but you file your return on a six monthly basis. Or for that matter, when you look at uh, smaller taxpayers like firms and individuals, they paid their taxes on a quarterly basis, but they filed their returns on a six monthly basis. So to that extent, you will be on a similar ground. Of course, people are saying that, why do you want me to uh, have so many due dates? But that's the way it is. And uh, it's not so different when you go to see income tax also. You pay taxes in four installment and you file one return. So how far that is different from this? Of course, that is summary data versus this is detailed information. So this is the annexure for amendments to return. Now, one more feature that they have added to the compliance process is you can actually amend the return. The process of amendment is quite similar to what you had under uh, Maharashtra value added tax. Until about uh, four years ago, you could amend the return as many times as you wanted. Then about two or three years ago, they said that you can amend it only once. And about last year, they said that, okay, we'll allow you to amend it twice. So in GST, they have said that we'll allow you to amend the return at least twice or other maximum two times. They have said that you please be sure of what you are amending because after two times, we'll not allow you to amend it anymore. So you please take your time in amending. Now, one thing that you have to be very, very careful about when you talk about amendment is that somewhere in the whole scheme of things, they have provided that if the amendment is resulting in a difference in the tax liability of more than 10%, you might end up with a higher late fee. I'll just come to that. Now, 
there is a upper cap of 10% of liability. If the amendment is resulting in more than 10% of additional liability, you will end up paying a higher fee for making the amendment. And that is apart from the interest that you are already paying. So this is something else that they have added. This is another burden that they have added. You need to be careful. So this is the return uh, where you are making only B to C supplies. So you're talking about small traders. You may be, uh, you know, you don't make any supplies to registered persons. There's no chance of making any, it is a, a consumable item where there is no chance of making a supply to a registered person. The standard data that you need to fill is the same, your name, uh, AR, name, JSON number, so on and so forth. And all you need to give is very, very basic data, just like you fill up even today in the B2C column. You need to give data of local versus interstate. You just need to split it up. You need to give data of uh, invert supplies separately. Again, this will be auto-populated because while you are making supplies to consumers, you may be receiving supplies from businesses, in which case you want to claim credit. So for that, uh, you will still have to go through the rigor of the annexure for invert supplies. Coming to the next part where you are making B2C plus B2B supplies, but to persons other than SEZs, other than exports and deemed exports. So, the table is to a certain extent truncated. You don't have to report anything as far as SEZ uh, supplies or exports and other supplies are concerned. You just need to give supplies of B2B and B2C. The data that you need to provide remains the same. You need to give an HSN summary as usual. And of course, the inward supplies will flow to you from your annexure. Now, to what extent I would say that uh, the expectations have been met. Is the present system rigid? Is it inflexible? Yes, it is inflexible. Is the process lengthy? Yes, it is lengthy. Does it give you sufficient time? No, it doesn't give you sufficient time. Reconciliation matching process, has it been kept only on one side to a certain extent? Yes, I can say that. It has been kept unidirectional. The flow is from the supplier to the recipient, but you still do not have a control to say if he has not uploaded any data, then what happens to it? Option to rectify is available to you. You have two revisions that you can do. It's a very, very limited window that you've got. You have to be careful. The concept of provisional credit is now being done away with completely. You will be able to take only that credit which flows into your account irrespective of the fact that you have paid for that tax. Only that credit which is flowing into account you will be able to do. You will not be able to add any single advice, uh, invoice. You will not be able to add any single paisa for any service that you have received but for which the supplier is in default. To a certain extent, yes, they have consolidated the returns. They have made it into one single form. But while the return is consolidated, they have added the annexures. So what you had GSTR1 is the annexure to main return. What was your GSTR2 is actually annexure of inward supplies. And your GSTR3 is your main return. So to that extent, we need to understand this is a complete eyewash. Nothing has changed. You're still going to do the same thing only thing in a different manner. To a certain extent, you have a statement of mismatches which you will be uploading. The interest related relief which was asked for, which we have been saying, but that is not available. The periodicity to a certain extent, yes, there is a relief. So 
smaller taxpayers can now file on a quarterly basis larger taxpayers have five more days to match their input credit it's hardly a relief there is no need for you to upload the invoice while that seems like a good feature you have actually uh, cut your hands and legs because now you can't add any supplies where they have not given uh, they have not uploaded the data you can claim only that credit which the supplier has uploaded and which the gst and in its whims and fancies will throw in your credit ledger i'm saying it with a bit of a caveat because I, at the end of the day it's a man made system it will definitely have some flaws and you don't know what comes in your account what doesn't come in your account you know i we actually had a situation where uh, we were told by the supplier i have uploaded i don't know why it is not coming in your account so he actually showed us the acknowledgement he said i'm giving you my login you go and see you can see everything is there i don't know why it is not coming so it was a ticket that we have flagged we still don't have an answer the process has been made uh, singular it is only the suppliers who will upload the data for us we have to only check the data we have to accept reject and keep it pending periodic adjustment to a certain extent it seems that it is available but uh, one will have to look at the process and see whether or not it is actually available or not uh, with that uh, i would like to end this uh, presentation i will uh, take your questions and any other uh, things which you think i have not uh, uh, spoken about in my presentation but you would like me to talk about it please let me know thank you uh, one very uh, basic question in main return there is two annexure in in bottom of the annexure uh, there is a Uh, authorized signatory is required so in matlab in for filing one return i need to sign three times i did say that for all practical purposes you are going to do compliance with three times nothing else yes so is it single uploading or multiple uploading sameer you single uploading or multiple uploading as far as outward supplies are concerned it, it is you will it still it depends on you you can upload all the data on one day or you can upload it every day it's all up to you but i am on that part of the annexures to the main return hmm. whether that months because you know in the wet wall what is happening that we are preparing the annexure one and annexure two and it captures in the return and then we are uploading the single uploading return yes here it will be the same thing na no? because i need not to upload first annexure one then annexure two and then the three that we have to so see when annexure all no to that extent annexure 1 will be uploaded by the 10th annexure 2 will flow to you after the 11th only so to that extent it is still a two step process two steps process yes is it obligate for revision of september before september of next year time limit of uh, section 39 <laughs> so if it is a return pertaining to 18 19 maximum you could revise it up to september 19 so each if you are filing monthly each and every monthly return you can revise it two times up to september i think that's quite a bit uh, you said the blocking could be real time because though i mean as larger companies would have liked it to happen that way because many times they link payment to your uploading and uh, uh, the company locking it but what when we read the fine print it says that you the locking will be available only from the 11th no so for all practical purposes you are seeing it okay so this is something that we actually discussed with uh, mr prakash kumar and he said the moment you so your accept reject is going to happen only in the annexure for all practical purposes now when you are seeing the data how that interface will look at what you will be able to see and how you will see that one needs to see when the interface comes but the manner in which they are talking about it they are saying that you will be able to see it literally every day Yeah, because seeing sometimes because up to tenth you have an opportunity to again amend it or edit it or change it. So, oh, so there are anyway you have to do your reconciliation only after eleventh. You cannot do earlier and say okay, okay I have logged so many so my this part is over. There are several uh, permutation combinations that you can look at. You might have a situation where I am uploading on a daily basis. Now I raised an invoice today for some reason uh, that supply did not happen. I had to cancel it tomorrow. 
if it got locked i have no choice but i have to raise a credit note now the way we understand it credit note can be raised only in two or three circumstances can you cancel this you might have a situation now it's very very common that you know uh, i would uh, as a manufacturer i would have uh, uh, raised invoices on a daily basis okay on the 29th and the 30th i have raised invoices i have uploaded instantly because of the way the system is integrated but the truck did not leave on 29th on the 30th and for whatever be the reason i cancelled the invoice i cancelled the invoice now that cancellation happened in the next month today i might not report it only because i am able to capture it tomorrow if i have uploaded and that fellow has locked it whether it will happen whether i can cancel it whether i can stop it i don't know and this is a live situation where we are telling customers that you know please have a look at it because while you might want to have you might want to be uh, you know timely you want to comply situations like this can result in a situation where you are not reporting the correct liability inadvertently and at the same time you might have a cash outflow at the first instance how that locking will take place we yeah, still we have, have to still see. to see that's it in uh, one way it is a unidirectional flow of credits means hmm. unless supplier is upload the uh, invoice i cannot avail the credit so uh, in table in next year there is a table 3l hmm relates to missing invoices yes so missing invoice at our own i can take the credit at our own i can avail the credit we'll have to see how much that uh... no the way i understand this when you say missing invoices on which credit has been claimed in t2 and the supplier has not reported the same till filing i don't know whether these are going to be the type where you are reporting your liability or it is going to be those part where you are going to say that you know you please allow me to take credit basically this uh, 3l table will be for only 6 month Hmm. because somewhere in serial number 4 they are saying that this in, this will be available only for the transactional period and the transaction period is only for 6 months so after that there is will be no relevance of uh, missing invoices the credit will be flow on the unidirectional period only one way true i'll just answer this one query that i received so uh, the question is up to what turnover figure it will go for assessment to maharashtra government sales tax department uh that you will have to actually refer to the notification uh, which is uh, talking about the division of tax payers there is a notification which is put up on the maharashtra uh, government website maharashtra uh, vat uh, website yeah actually it's outside only it's not even inside so you just have to look for that notification it is uh, uh, it gives a detailed excel sheet the sheet is somewhere 47 mb so you better have good bandwidth to download it or otherwise you can ask i mean uh, you can ask somebody else to look at it yeah yeah now there is addition yes the second one is this uh, new system will be applicable from which date right now they are saying it will be applicable from april 19 so we don't know whether uh, they will stick to that whether they will change the deadline we don't know yes see uh, one of the essential feature of any of this uh, regulation or return is that you have to match it with your books of accounts because in tax audit if they every sphere you have to say give the reconciliation what is the different reason thereof so this provision that we have that on 10th till 10th you can upload it and that you pay the liability on the 20th and then next 10 days 10 days whatever you can upload also you take the liability so this uh, thing or situation where organization close the books on 10th or 12th so the return liability and the books liability will be different so that will definitely give rise to reconciliation after reconciliation of reconciliation and there difference of liability which has to be reported but that's bound to happen in several places apart so you might have goods might be a specific situation services might be a different situation right so you might in your books of accounts have a situation where you have unbilled revenue yes that has always been a bone of contention in service tax it continues to be in uh, this thing also in uh, gsc also but the liability will in in case of unbilled revenue there was a mismatch of liability there there in this case there is a mismatch of liability no there so there will always be a timing this there will always be a timing this but i think we'll have to actually because of this uh, 10th uh, date and all we'll always have that as a process i think i think that's a very valid point and with that uh, i think I, i would like to thank you i think uh, samir has done a, uh, we can take questions offline after a couple of minutes just a couple of minutes uh, for uh, 
formal thang, uh, vote of thanks. Uh, of course, Samir has dealt with the entire concept very well, taken us through the past, the pro, uh, proposed changes, and uh, thereafter explaining the limitations of the new system as well. I'll uh, straight away request uh, Mandar to propose a well deserved vote of thanks. But before that, let me request uh, Suhas, uh, our treasurer, to present a uh, vote of frame on our behalf. Friends, before uh, proposing a formal vote of thanks, I have some important announcements to make. Uh, uh, I've heard people saying that uh, this GSA system is a mess, and uh, some of them have also gone to the extent of saying this is a monster. But uh, I believe that a known devil is better than an unknown devil, and what BCA is trying to do is that make you aware of what are the features of this devil. And in fact, in that particular respect, only uh, uh, on 8th of August, we had kept a meeting, uh, inter interactive session with the GSTN officer. And uh, as a result of that particular process, probably we can act uh, as an intermediary whereby if you have any specific issues, system issues, you can probably share it with us and we may be in a position to at least forward those issues with the GSTN people so as to arrive at a better solution. So how that particular modus operandi would be there? Probably you will get it shortly within a week's time uh, on our website www.bca.org.in. So probably over there you will get to know the manner in which you would be in a position to communicate to us your issues and we would definitely forward those issues to a right person so that uh, there would be a easy and good resolutions of the queries. Uh, another attempt has been made because uh, it's always our attempt. In fact, in our BCS annual plan also harnessing technology is one of our agenda. So with this, uh, tomorrow at the very same day, uh, the taxation committee has organized uh, an interactive session with the officials from uh, NSDL and TRACES uh, to deal with the recent developments in the uh, TRACES for TDS processing. So I am looking forward to uh, all you people again coming or meeting tomorrow uh, at the very same place. Um, also, I think a handout has been already circulated to us of, about the BCS uh, forthcoming events, two of which I would like to specifically draw your attention to. Uh, one is the um, uh, GST audit, a curtain raiser program, uh, similar to a lecture meeting which is kept on Wednesday, 5th of September 2018, where probably these issues relating to your reconciliation and all those issues will be properly dealt with by Mr. Parin Mehta. And the uh, indirect tax committee has also come out with a very long duration course. Uh, it's, it's a six days course. Uh, more than 30 speakers would be going to address the participants. The seats are limited and I believe more than 50 seats have already been uh, uh, filled. So please enroll as far as possible, as soon as possible, because this is open to both members as well as to non-members. And it's a very extensive uh, workshop with uh, more than 45 hours of learning. Um, with this, uh, I believe I, I uh, now do, uh, I come to the uh, important task of uh, performing a hearty vote of thanks. Uh, friends, uh, a wise man once said that the technology can create wonders as well as blunders. Uh, uh, Samir Kapadia has, uh, I think, taken us through a detailed processing of this particular uh, devil and uh, uh, has also tried to highlight various issues which probably could result either into wonders or blunders, which probably only the time will tell us. And uh, one thing is sure that if we know this devil properly, then you will never know uh, when this devil will start working for you like a genie. So probably we all should uh, uh, put our hands together and uh, thank uh, Mr. Kapadia for giving us uh, this enlightened address on the recent uh, developments in the, in the GST returns. Thank you.